Greetings, mammalians, and welcome to Wall Street Wildlife. The investing podcast that will help you better understand how to make money in the stock market. I'm Christoph Monkey Pikarski. And I'm Luke the Badger Hallard. Today is December 18th, 2023, last days of the year. Getting there, nearly at year end. Uh, and we've only got two topics for you today. We're going to keep it short and sweet. We're going to tackle the King of the Jungle update first, because Christoph is still convinced that that is the most exciting topic. And I love talking about this topic because I'm kicking his ass so badly. So, hey, let's get that. Let's get straight into that one. Uh, but we're also going to chat about the Santa Claus rally. What is the Santa Claus rally? Do you need to be concerned with it? Should you do something to take advantage of it? Let's find out in our second segment. All right. So, uh, listeners, to those of you who can't see me, I'm wearing my baboon hat. Uh, that's, the, that's the monkey with the with the red ass because <laughs> that's, really, that's, the moment, that's, that's what I feel like uh given that that badger is whooping whooping my ass by about looks to be 350 bananas uh and we're uh one well no we're about two months into the competition so not a good feeling uh badger what what do you uh what do you think you're doing right I think I've been lucky, all right, I'll be honest, right? But I'm just doing what I always did and always always done for the last 20 years, buying the world's highest quality companies and letting time do its magic. Um, and I wouldn't expect to see, what, like a 30 odd percent return in two months in my real portfolio, that's nuts. Um, just the luck of when we started the competition, to be honest. If I finish the competition at this same number, I'll be pretty happy. What have you wow. done wrong, though? Why, why are you down? Well, <laughs> let me count the ways. <laughs> How much time you have? Uh, I think there's, well, you know, hindsight makes the things that didn't work all seem like mistakes. And I'm not sure how many legitimate mistakes I have. So it's kind of, it, it, you could help me tease this out a little bit. Uh, but the down positions, the two big down positions are my two puts. I bought puts in KRE, which is a regional bank ETF, and I bought puts against Bank of America. And so I did this nearly this, uh, at the start of our challenge when, if you remember way back to two months ago, everything was dying and everything was really, really bad in part because I actually think everything is really, really bad from the macro level. The market thinks otherwise. And so this is the trouble, this is the difficulty of using macro as one of your investing levers is because even if you're right, the timing of it is, is hard to get exactly right. So in this moment, Badger, I think, I hate to say it, but if you listen to the seven investing subscriber call, you'll know that I'm being a big time bear for the first time in my investing career because I can't overlook all of the things that I'm seeing. And so I think I'm right that macro will in fact become so severe that the stock market will have a severe downturn, but I bet that will happen in October. And since then, the market has done nothing but gone straight up, proving that in the short term, that was a mistake. Not, and not even necessarily a mistake, as you say, right? You've got, it's not like you're wildly making short bets. Um, you're using your insight and knowledge about the world. And I agree with your position on what's potentially brewing with commercial real estate, which I think is what underpins your negative bet on regional banks. Um, but, you know, the market teaches us time and time again, even long term investors, uh, that you, you know, you can, you can be right, but uh, you can get your ass pounded like a baboon for years before uh, being right finally actually makes a positive difference to your portfolio. 
Yeah, by the way, listeners, uh, I'm doing this to myself. I chose to wear this baboon hat. So it's not like Luke is being a mean sadist. I'm like, <laughs> I'm, I'm just playing the role, I suppose, of the, the masochist willingly. So this is the hard part about investing. I think I'm right about these short term bets. In the meantime, the market is telling me uh, you're wrong for now. And it's, uh, it's been a, a painful lesson in terms of my portfolio. Okay. So this, this, my second, uh, biggest down position after the two puts is EOS. And that is a mistake in just the typical investing sense that the company recently diluted shareholders to the tune of 50 million, which we were expecting. But all of that is happening because the closing of the conditional DOE loan was pushed back by a quarter requiring more cash. And so even though the story remains intact for the long term, and here I'm saying 25, 26, I still think this could be a massive, massive winner in the short term. The stock is rightly being punished. And so that's a deservedly red position. And if you're an EOS shareholder or you're interested in EOS, go check out our bonus episode with our regular guest, Mr. Nod Advice from maybe like a week ago. Uh, we listened to their uh, strategy call live and then we did a quick turnaround same day podcast telling you guys what we thought about the stock and what was happening. And then actually what happened because the, the company three or four days after making some announcements on their strategy call, seemingly about faced on how they were going to raise money. And I think that's hurt them, hasn't it? Yeah, it was, it, it's a very divided, uh, it's easy. It's a, it's an ambig, deeply ambiguous and ambivalent financing position. Some folks in the investing community are saying, well, they told us they would need more money and that they were going to raise it via structured debt and some kind and or equity. And then when they released 50 million, a 50 million offering people, people were like, wait, this isn't structured debt. debt. This is not a credit facility. This, this is straight up outright dilution. And others are saying, yeah, but they told us they would raise this amount of money. So it's kind of a, a mess. And in the short term, the company from the purely financial standpoint remains a mess. And simultaneously, the bullish view is, okay, well, now they obviously have all the money they need to get this automated line up. And as soon as that is up, all of the reason to be invested in this will start coming true. Whereas the market is still rating it as near bankruptcy levels. So it's a really messy situation. I'm not selling, I'm holding, which is my official position for seven investing as well. Um, and let's reflect briefly on what's happening in my portfolio, because things are looking greener than I would have expected. As I said just now, like if I finish the year up 20 or 30%, I'll be pretty happy. And hopefully that's enough to win the competition. Kind of let's see. Um, but if I look across the board at my holdings, I think I've got uh, seven different stocks in there. Like, I, I've been quite lucky, I suppose, my timing. Six of my seven are up, and two of them are really materially up. Like, I just got great timing with the start of the competition with you for, the, for Wall Street Wildlife with CrowdStrike and Mercado Libre. But these are among, two among my highest conviction investments in my own personal portfolio. So, like, I'm super happy because... Um, I'm making real money outside the game uh, that's funding my lifestyle. Um, and one of these is a company that I bought for all my nieces and nephews for their Christmas present. So, and the, and the other one is one I plan to buy from them uh, this coming Christmas. So yeah, it's, it's good. This is like the good part of being a long-term investor. You back what you think are the world's greatest companies and then you get rewarded for that. But for some years now I've been sitting on my crowd strike position with my head in my hands a little bit below my cost basis it's nice for the market to finally acknowledge that the two things I've known to be true for some time cybersecurity is just one of the most important capabilities for any company and becoming more important and crowd strike are one of the leaders in that space I'm gonna take 
a fair share of the gains across the across that whole industry. So um, yeah, so I'm pretty pleased with how my scorecard's working out. Yeah, I mean, it looks your pastures are much much greener than mine, of course, and. Uh, th this is complicated. Uh, I have a bunch of complicated, hard feelings about this is because I, I've been a CrowdStrike shareholder for many, many, many years. And I just recently sold out uh, of my own position because of the extreme bearish view that I've been holding. And so it's, it's um, for me, everything as an investor I'm doing now seems to be backfiring, which is, you know, after so many years of doing this, it's, it's a learning experience for sure but i'm i'm still not going to put my trades in the bucket of mistakes i still think this is in this moment what i think is we're see, what i think we're seeing is a market exuberance that is unjustified given the fundamentals and that can take some time to systemically play itself out so for now, Badger, you are the great and obvious beneficiary of what I call market exuberance. I've got, I got, I got, I got a choice for you here, right? Because I'm, do you want me to take this conversation in a, a comedic direction or in a serious <laughs> direction? <laughs> Can we do both? <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, the, 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 yeah, the spanking or the yeah. or the jesting. Yeah. Let me soften you up with the comedy, right? Because uh, I didn't realize you'd sold out of your CrowdStrike position, and that that tells me something. Um, so here's the, here's this comedy to soften you up, uh, and it's just a reflection on the the GIF I posted on Slack for Seven Investing the other day. So go check out Twitter. There's this. I think I retweeted it. There's this awesome uh, GIF of I think it's like the Lou Ferrigno hulk david banner the hulk with a bear in his hands and he's like slinging the bear across the forest like 50 yards across the forest and uh, like it's a bad time to be a bear the market is the hulk and it's like it's giving you the slam down um and you are the bear getting slammed down uh if if you have taken your bearishness though to the extent that you're completely exiting companies like crowdstrike well, you deserve that um, baboon's bottom, my buddy. Um, you used to, you, you have always, I, we've known each other a, a little while now, a couple of years, and uh, you have an incredible reputation as um, one of the world's best long-term strategic investors. You know, you've got decades uh, uh, of offering great quality advice to other investors on notable uh, services message boards and I, I was reading your stuff long long before I knew you you have completely turned around it, it, based on you what you just told me about CrowdStrike and presumably then other high quality companies in your portfolio and my friend that is why you're getting your ass handed to you because you've done great for years you started doing something differently and now you're paying the price for that yeah absolutely I am paying the price in this moment for that severely and it's really painful so you know that's the realistic realistic portion of the show without trying to justify what is now a losing position in the sense of you know i'm i don't think i'm wrong i'm wrong in this moment so let's get that up front i'm trying to maybe reason reason legitimately out why I why I did what I did and part of it I think is that I lived through the well I started investing very young so I lived through the tech bubble and then I lived through the 2008 financial crash and now uh and COVID in the COVID crash and now what I'm seeing is a setup that portends from everything I'm reading across all data points to be P potentially as bad as the 2008 one and when it gets that bad it really really gets bad so i chose to increase my cash position so that i can become more nimble and in the long-term plan was to acquire more crowdstrike and more mercado libre uh and and the companies i truly believe for the long term like tesla and nvidia but way, way cheaper, given that valuations are really extended and all this nasty, nasty data is lurking in the background. 
The problem, I think, is obvious. Even if I'm right in terms of the data, the timing of it is so hard to get right that in this interim, I'm just flat out wrong and it's costing me money. But you know what? As in, you're giving yourself more tough decisions in the future because if you've essentially um, you know, disinvested to some large degree and maybe you're short, like at what point do you say, okay, now it's turning around, now I'm going to start buying back in? That's quite a tough decision to decide when to start. And like we both know, when the market goes down, it sometimes goes down fast. And when the market recovers, it often recovers fast. Like if you, there's a whole bunch of stats. If you miss like the, the three or four biggest up days in a five or six year cycle, like you halve your overall returns. <clears throat> That's right. That's why this is new territory for me. And I agree with, I have had, I've, in the past, I would have agreed with that 100%. And I do still, to be honest, in most ways. It's just that in this particular moment, I think things are so bad that this decision about when to get back in is going to happen over... I don't think it will be hard because I think once the wheels really start coming off, they're going to be coming off for months and months and months. And so it's because of the extreme view of the bearishness. I'm not thinking of this as like a, a bump in the road or like we're going to get some. I think the reason that the, the bonds dropped 75 basis points in a short amount of time is because something already broke. I don't want to get into the big dark macro picture, but I'm going to counter with this isn't about me missing a couple of days of rebound. I'm planning to be out of the market and watching it drop severely for a long time. So I'm not going to be like sitting at the edge of my chair, like waiting. Is this the day? Is this the day? I think it's going to, it's, I'm, <laughs> This is the first time as an investor I'm thinking the whole system might be on the verge of teetering. And when you add valuations that are very, very expensive, that's a recipe for disaster, like, you know, 50, 60, 70 percent drops. So if I'm wrong, it's it's a yeah, it, it'll be horrible. Like I, uh, I, if I'm right, it'll be horrible too. Because sure, yeah. because <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, such as the uh, such as the emotional world of a bear, right? You know, it's when you're right. I'm learning. When, it's like yeah. it's like paying the don't pass on the craps table when you're winning, everyone else is losing, right? So you you don't necessarily feel good about yourself. Um, but putting that bit aside, um, like I don't know, you know much more about macro than I do, but. I tend to try to ignore it um, and just invest through every cycle up and down. Um, and I just balance my allocation of cash based on my confidence level. And you shook my confidence in the last couple of weeks. So I'm a little bit more cash. I'm about 20% cash now. If the ass fell out of the market and my, uh, the 80% I have invested, if that like halves in value, as you know, maybe not that magnitude, but you're kind of implying severe drops then I guess the buying power of that 20% goes up relatively. And so I'm, I think I would be ambivalent. I, I wouldn't be unhappy or happy in that situation. It's just kind of, it is what it is. This is a long-term play. Um, yeah, it's diff difficult. Like I, um, I, like I said, I'm not a macro guy, but in favor of this being a sustained up rally, not just a, we'll get onto the Santa Claus rally in a minute, but um, you know, in favor of this being a sustained up rally okay there are there are several very overvalued stocks out there but not many at the insane valuations that we were seeing let's say in 2020 like post pandemic um things but things are expensive um in favor of this being a sustained rally inflation and interest rates are turning and probably coming down looking at the um fomc's dot plot a few weeks ago um like it seems like members of the committee, um, which is essentially like the US financial system, uh, as a committee, they believe uh, inflation and therefore they should lower interest rates in a 
fairly sort of modest way over the coming few quarters. Well, so this is, yeah, so this is where, uh, this is an interesting crossroads for, inv for investors listening to us. One interpretation is what Badger just talked about, that there's a sort of, the Fed has achieved a quasi miracle a soft landing is on its way. The lowering of interest rates is what we've been waiting for and the market is now pricing in a soft landing. I'm taking a vastly different interpretation, the much darker one. Uh, and I'm saying because the data is so bad across so many sectors and so many economies are in trouble that the reason they're pivoting and dropping the interest rates is not because inflation has been conquered. It's because the system is already breaking and the system runs on credit. You need credit to keep growth alive. And in no place in the market are we growing. Credit is tightening. And so how do you get the system moving again? You have to, to increase credit, access to credit, you have to lower rates. But it's too little too late is my position. Okay. And we're going to uh, see an unwinding of many complex puzzle pieces. And it's going to be very, very ugly. Uh, that said, let me say one more thing about my portfolio, if, if that's all right, Badger. Uh, the, the, you will see that I have one position that is up over 50%. And that's Relay. Mm -hmm. So I haven't so that's the, out of all our cumulative positions, that's the one that has had the most success. So that's one of the picks I made because it's also not, as a biotech, it's not correlated with the market per se. Uh, and the other one, Coherus, which is down, uh, it's down like 20 something percent, my biggest position. That's also a question of timing, also not really correlated with the market. It's a small cap waiting for an inflection moment I expect to happen sometime in Q1, Q2. So I'm not worried about that being down while everything else is up. And of course, I sold one position due to SoFi shenanigans, not because I wanted to uh, chain link at a profit of 30 something percent. So it's an ugly look for monkey, no, no, no doubt about it, but I hate to say it, but when we look back in let's say March or April, for your well-being, Badger, I hope <laughs> I hope the candles are still as green as they are, but I suspect that it won't look as pretty. Let's see. I guess uh, time time will teach us. Either way, I, I hope for the sake of the majority of listeners that uh, that we do we're not facing the doom that you're portending. But if you believe that we are, then maybe it's time to consider a little bit of hedging and insuring within your own portfolio. So something to think about, I guess. Yeah. And actually, let me say one, one thing based on what you, you said earlier to Luke, um, which is that you, even though you are still in the long-term buy and hold camp and you have not wavered like I have, you did take some of the things I was, I was saying seriously, and you did increase your cash position. And the, I think the good, uh, what's it called? The good metric t by which to live is whether or not you're having anxiety at night. And my understanding, right, is when you have a larger cash position, you you do, you sleep better. I got 10 hours sleep last moment. night, slept like a baby. Yeah, absolutely. There you go. <laughs> well, you're sleeping for all the right reasons. I mean, your portfolio is up, you have more cash, you have, you have, if you have gold nuggets coming out of your ears, like what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but for, for listeners, you know, that's something I learned later in the game that it's not the, it's not the dumbest thing in the world to consider your cash position as an actual position in your portfolio, because that's a risk, uh, management kind of thing. And if it helps you sleep better at night, especially in potentially turbulent times, sleep is worth a lot. Totally. And, um, and if you've got a material cash position, like it doesn't have to be cash, you could still get in treasuries in bonds. There's, there are good and bad ways to do that kind of thing. Maybe it's something we'll talk about in a future episode, not today. Um, but when we say cash, we mean like all of that stuff that's not, uh, equities, derivatives and other weird stuff. 
So as we're coming up to the halfway point on our episode, and uh, we do want to remind you guys, if you're enjoying Wall Street Wildlife, give us a like, give us a subscribe, go find us on YouTube, if you're on our podcast, go find us on YouTube anyway, you can see some pretty pictures, and like my cat was sat next to me earlier, you can check out Sushi. Um, yeah, check, check in, find us on all platforms, and go find us on Twitter slash X. I'm at 7LukeHallard. Um at seven flying platypus. And also, uh, I spent a significant portion of my waking hours last week making us a pretty website. So if you go to wallstreetwildlife.com, you'll find links to our YouTube, X, Spotify, as well as our Substack, which has uh, summaries of all these episodes and videos. And uh, and the portfolio challenge. Yes, yeah, a live view of the portfolio. If you want to see uh, how much that baboon is getting his ass spanked, <laughs> <laughs> there's another website we contribute to as well. It's seveninvesting.com, uh, where Christoph and I are both lead advisors. We have just with a team completed a fairly mammoth piece of work. We've completed our year in review. We've gone through many hundreds of recommendations we've made over the years and we've assigned all of them a conviction rating we've flagged our strongest buys the stocks we think are still a buy those where we're a little concerned and a hold and uh, we've also sold a few things off of the scorecard recently i sold one of my recommendations from 2022 um, just in the last few weeks check out seven investing and i will say uh, if you look at the fabulous green stocks on my Wall Street Wildlife portfolio. A couple of those, I'm not going to tell you which ones, but a couple of those are my highest conviction stocks for seven investing. And they are just doing fantastically on the seven investing scorecard, which is uh, really looking healthy for me right now. Right. Likewise, uh, I'd like to say that, that over at seven investing, we're aiming to use 2024 as a year in which we double down on our highest conviction picks in companies and so we're looking to trim uh the stuff that seems not to have passed the test and so rather than going for more is more we're looking to increase quality quantity i'm sorry quality over quantity so uh check out that year in review report it's a uh, it, it, it's a really uh important document and, and if you're interested in joining uh, there's a whole bunch of really good free content there but if you want to become a subscriber see the recommendations if you subscribe with promo code wildlife you'll get a, a nice little discount just to get you started so go check that out all right so you want to talk about what you think is happening in the market at year's end badger yeah well hey look reflecting on our conversation of the last couple of minutes right it's the santa claus rally for everyone apart from you bears i guess it's like the grinch rally for you the grinch has come and stolen all of your profits with uh with the upswing so what is the santa claus rally what's actually happening the saying is that around christmas time the stock market tends to increase over the christmas season and there is a little bit of of rationale for why this might be the case some theories are that people are just spending more. So, you know, that increased retail spending kind of flows through the economy in lots of ways, helps all sorts of companies, not just e-commerce companies. Um, people are happy, you know, they're going to Christmas parties, they're having a good time. And so they're optimistic and the stock market does tend to reflect the emotions, or in, at least in the short term, of its participants. Um, but also for tax reasons. I mean, it could be, there could be good reasons why an investor is uh, making certain trades towards year end like is that that's the end of the tax year in the us is it end of december yeah mm -hmm. in the uk it's kind of the start of april um but if you need to realize some losses that might be a reason to sell and maybe invest that money again in something else so you know it could be lots of things going on or it just could be complete nonsense and uh, uh and it's just you know people have put a funny name on something and it doesn't really tell you a lot about what's really going to happen I'm not sure you could use it to predict too much. I don't know who's successfully running a portfolio where they kind of buy everything uh, in late December and then sell it all again at the start of January. But um, I guess that is one thing some people might be doing. If you are, let us know if that's been successful. Yeah, and uh, I want to add that contrary to, this might not be obvious, 
But contrary to what my portfolio looks like, notice that I took out my short positions in October when everything was gloom and doom. And since then, I have not added to those positions. That might be that might not be obvious, but a true bear would just say, well, I'm right. And then the market's wrong and keep adding. Right. But what I'm doing is I'm paying attention to what, what the market is telling me. And the market is telling me via the actual prices going up that it thinks prices deserve to go up. So my trades have been to the upside. In other words, despite holding a bearish macro view, I'm saying pay attention to the momentum that the market is showing. And the market is saying, yeah, uh, for now, things ought to be priced higher. And so expect my upcoming trades not to be bearish, but to say, okay, market, yeah, I'll, I'll uh, hop on this rally for, for a little while, but I certainly won't be deluded into thinking that it's based by uh, fundamentals that will sustain what I call reality, the coming of reality. So rallies are fun. I mean, they're interesting, and there's a way, I think, to take advantage of them in the short term as long as you know what you're doing, as long as you're not deluded into into thinking this kind of stuff is sustainable. Yeah, who knows? I get as a long term investor, what am I doing to take advantage of the Santa Claus rally? Like absolutely nothing. It makes no difference to my portfolio whatsoever. Because uh, I'm not thinking in like months, I'm thinking in not even years, in decades. Um, so I just try and buy good quality stuff and hold it as long as I can. Maybe I did make a small mistake going slightly heavier cash, well actually a chunk heavier cash, uh, what, about 10 days ago, maybe I should have waited till after the Santa Claus rally if it was, if it was something I was taking advantage of, but whatever, I'm, I feel like I slept better last night because I didn't own some of the stuff that I now have much less conviction in and have since sold. Yeah, and both of our portfolios have uh, a decent amount of cash just waiting, waiting to be deployed, and for me right now, uh, it pains me to, to give my bearish outlook to add to the long positions, but I have a few in mind. So I think uh, by next week, you ought to see some new additions to the long side. In the King of the Jungle portfolio, so you've got some, we're going to add some more money on the 1st of January, but you've got a bit of cash in there, have you, to, uh, to reinvest right now? Yeah, I have, uh, I think, uh, 144, if I'm not mistaken. Great, very good. Yeah, so it's, uh, well, I guess, relatively speaking, that's, uh, uh, eight, well, no, I have uh, 18%. Yeah, 18% of my holdings is cash right now. Right. Uh, maybe I am bearish because 38% of my King of the Jungle portfolio is currently cash. <laughs> <laughs> it's just that I haven't invested it yet. <laughs> I'm dollar cost averaging my way in for the game. That's how I would do it in the real world. Right. Yeah, so it's hard to say who's telling the truth yeah. about it. <laughs> I'm a hidden bear. <laughs> so I guess we're coming up on a wrap on the latest episode of Wall Street Wildlife. Uh, we've got a really interesting episode for you next week. I met with one of my friends, Dan, and Dan, unfortunately, has been involved in an investment scam and he's lost £10,000, all of his savings. Dan is kind enough to sit down with me for a couple of minutes and share his story with Wall Street Wildlife listeners. And I think there's some definite red flags and learnings in there that we should all be aware of, uh, particularly if we're newer investors. So tune in next week for that one. And then I just soon after that, it's coming up to New Year. What have we got planned for our New Year episode? We're thinking of doing our three most impactful or favorite things of the year, uh, anything relating to the investing world. So <laughs> by year end overview, followed by uh, an episode in which we're going to predict all the things that are going to happen because we're so good at that. <laughs> <laughs> we should dig in. I think we did some predictions for the No Limit podcast. Maybe we should go and dig those out and see what we predicted. Oh, yeah, that would be good, right, yeah. yeah. We need to hold ourselves to account. <laughs> all right, well, happy holidays to to all of you jungle beasts and, and critters. May they be safe, warm, and jolly. Happy holidays, folks. This is Wall Street Wildlife. Are you ready to become a beast of an investor? Your journey starts here. Ah. Woo. Woo -hoo -hoo. Woo -hoo -hoo -hoo.
A reminder that the people on this program may hold positions in the companies that are mentioned. Buying and selling stock carries financial risk, which could include loss of capital. The views in this program should not be taken as personalized advice. Before acting on any of the information provided, listeners are encouraged to consult a financial or tax professional.